concept of vaccines dates back to China and India in the 10th century, but vaccines have carried controversy with them ever since. However, modern-day vaccination has given us the eradication of smallpox and near eradication of polio in just the last 60 or so years. A vaccine is a suspension, a medicine in liquid form, that we receive orally or parenterally as an injectable. The suspension contains either a live, usually attenuated or inactivated microorganism, which can be a bacteria or a virus. The microorganism can be whole or fragmented, broken into pieces to make it safer for the patient. The goal of this suspension is to induce a response from our immune system, which will prevent the spread of a specific disease in our bodies. Vaccines use the various mechanisms of our immune system to create awareness of a new pathogen. That awareness initiates and develops an adaptive immune response that results in pathogen-specific antibodies and T-cells that in turn protect our bodies from infection. Some vaccines are formulated with components that are the same or very similar to the real pathogen. This makes them capable of eliciting very specific and strong immune responses. But there are other vaccines that are more departed from the original invader, and therefore the immune response they elicit is weaker. To boost the response of the immune system to a particular vaccine, more than one dose may be necessary. Some pathogens are capable of disguising themselves from the immune system and evade capture, which is the case of HIV, for example. Other viruses mutate frequently to reduce the chances of an effective immune response against them, which is the case of influenza. In cases like this, designing an effective vaccine is more challenging. We find there are many different types of vaccines depending on the pathogen we need to combat. Each type is tailored to provide the best immune response for a particular infection. These are some of the most common vaccine types. Life attenuated. This type of vaccine uses a viable or a live but weakened version of the agent that causes the disease, a viral particle in most cases. Said agent is weakened by adapting it to a different set of conditions from those found naturally in the population. Those conditions may be a new host or a new growing temperature. Adapting the agent to grow in a new set of conditions makes the agent safer as a vaccine candidate, as is less likely to cause disease upon administration. Attenuation may also be accomplished by reassortment or playing with pieces of the microorganism's genetic material. MMR, or measles, mumps, and rubella, is a well-known example of this type of vaccine. Inactivated vaccine. In this case, the disease-causing agent is neutralized using thermal, chemical, or radiation methods. There are many subtypes of inactivated vaccines. They may be whole, split, or subunit. In a whole vaccine, the agent is inactivated but remains integral in size and shape. A split vaccine uses a detergent to break the agent apart into segments. A subunit vaccine takes the segments of the split vaccine and further purifies them for a final suspension that includes only the portion of the agent that are believed best at mounting a good immune response. Well-known examples of this type of vaccine include influenza and polio vaccine. Conjugated vaccines. Conjugated vaccines are used mostly for the prevention of bacterial infection. They consist of a protein carrier linked to a purified long chain of sugar molecules that make up the surface of the capsule of certain bacteria. The protein carrier is used to alert the immune system of the bacterial segment that is bringing along. This presentation approach by the carrier should facilitate a better immune response. Prefnar 13 is the best known example of this type of vaccine. It is routinely administered to babies for the prevention of pneumococcal infection. Recombinant. This type of vaccine is created by modifying the genome of a host cell. It can be a bacteria, yeast, insect cell, plant or mammalian cell to express a protein of interest that adequately stimulates an immune response. By understanding the physical characteristics of the agent that causes the disease, a relevant protein can be identified that may stimulate the immune system appropriately. 
Then DNA encoding for that protein is inserted into the host cell alongside a promoter that induces overexpression of the protein of interest instead of the other proteins native to the host. Recombivax HB from Merck for the treatment of hepatitis B was the first human vaccine created by recombinant DNA technology. It was approved back in 1986. Nucleic acid. In this last case, a nucleic acid sequence encoding for a relevant segment of the agent against which an immune response is sought is introduced directly into the appropriate tissue. The genetic material is utilized by the patient's own cells to express the segment of the agent within the body, eliciting an immune response that may be very strong and specific. Traditionally, these vaccines have been done with plasmids containing DNA sequences. But in recent years, RNA has surfaced as a promising alternative. Each type of vaccine requires a different manufacturing process with their unique advantages and challenges. To make a vaccine, you start with some basic components, a source of the disease-causing agent, a method to purify the target agent to make it suitable for administration, and a battery of analytical essays that enable the characterization and quality control of the final product. Live attenuated vaccine production is one of the oldest processes. It is simple, with very few purification steps, making the process fast and high yielding, but generating a final product that may be considered dirty when compared to other biologics in the market. Following with the example we mentioned previously, production of MMR is tripartite. Measles, mumps, and rubella must be produced separately and then mixed in the appropriate ratios for the final formulation. The measles component is grown in chicken embryo cells, which are infected to express measles viral particles. The particles are then separated from the host cells by direct filtration and purified using a different type of filtration called tangential flow filtration. The mumps component is grown also in chicken embryo cells, but in this case the cells are infected to express mumps viral particles. Just like with measles, the viral particles are separated from the cells by direct filtration and purified using tangential flow filtration. Finally, the rubella component is grown in WI38 human diploid lung fibroblasts infected to express rubella virus. Once again, the particles are clarified with direct filtration and purified with tangential flow filtration. In contrast, inactivated vaccines may have many purification steps. Production may be tedious and time-consuming with very low yields at the end. But final product may be very clean, down to the basic components that are assumed responsible for eliciting the immune response. This is the case of subunit vaccines. These vaccines are less likely to produce side effects or allergic reactions, but may not generate as good an immune response as some of their life attenuated counterparts do. Moreover, they may be more expensive due to the lengthy production process. Producing a subunit influenza vaccine, for instance, begins with a strain selection. Given that the influenza virus mutates rapidly, and we see changes from one year to the next that render the previous version of the vaccine useless. Once the strain is selected, an attenuated version of the virus is created by an authorized organization, the CDC in the case of the United States. The attenuated virus strain is then inoculated into embryonated chicken eggs, our host in this case, where the virus infects the chick and expands over a period of two to three days. After the period of infection, the eggs are cracked open and the clear liquid that surrounds the embryo, where the viral particles are suspended, is collected for purification of the vaccine. Purification of the particles includes inactivation with a chemical agent that can be formaldehyde or BPL, splitting of the virus particles with a detergent that can be tried on X100 as a common alternative, centrifugation, chromatography, and tangential flow filtration. This process is repeated four times for each of the four individual components of the vaccines, one for each of the main circulating strains in the population during the year of production. A conjugated vaccine like Prefnar 13 requires to run the production process 13 times, one for each individual component. The protein carrier is produced by growing Corinebacterium diphtheria and extracting an non-toxic protein variant for later linking with the other components. 
The long chains of sugar that make up a conjugated vaccine are known as polysaccharides. Each of the 13 polysaccharides used in Prefnar 13 are grown individually using a bacteria known as Streptococcus pneumoniae. Each component is purified using tangential flow filtration, precipitation and chromatography, and then linked with the protein carrier using a chemical reaction. This process, needless to say, is time-consuming and expensive, but so far is the best vaccine for prevention of pneumococcal bacterial infections. Recombinant vaccines don't use naturally occurring hosts to grow the agent of interest. Instead, they use a host that has been genetically modified to express a specific protein or viral particle of interest. Said genetic modification can be done permanently to a cell line by inserting genetic material that encodes for the agent into the genome of the host. Or it can be done transiently by using a vector that forces the host cell to express the agent of interest. The vector is most of the time a virus. Host cells are grown individually to be healthy and high in number. Then the vector is introduced and the cells express the protein or particle of interest. The protein or particle of interest is then purified using the method listed before. Tangential flow filtration, centrifugation and chromatography are formulated for delivery to the final user. To make a vaccine based on a nucleic acid like DNA, the first thing you need is a sequence encoding the protein that you want to express in the body. Then that sequence can be inserted into a plasmid which is then purified and administered to the recipient. In recent years, mRNA has emerged as a better alternative to DNA for various reasons, but mainly because it is minimal genetic construct, only harboring the elements required for the expression of the protein of interest and is very unlikely that will interact with the host genome, eliminating the possibility of detrimental integration with the host. Moreover, mRNA has all the elements to become a platform technology, where you establish the production process for one product and then simply vary the target protein sequence to make a new vaccine when needed. mRNA, or messenger ribonucleic acid, is a single-stranded molecule that corresponds to the sequence of a gene, and it is read by ribosomes during the cellular process of protein production. mRNA cannot replicate, only carries the recipe to synthesize a protein, and this fact makes this technology very safe. In addition, mRNA is short-lived within the body, which means its effects will disappear shortly after administration with no additional effects. One of the more promising vaccines currently being tested to address the coronavirus pandemic is an mRNA vaccine. Production begins with mRNA synthesis, which involves having a cDNA template and a cocktail of enzymes. From here, a mixture is obtained that contains the desired mRNA. The mixture is purified using a combination of precipitation and extraction steps, but mainly relying on size exclusion chromatography to separate shorter or longer species from the desired product. Despite all its advantages, mRNA technology is very new and many things are not yet clear about the mechanism of action and its effectiveness in eliciting a well-developed immune response. When a new disease like COVID-19 emerges, the first step in designing a new vaccine involves characterization of the disease-causing agent, including genome sequencing, and its mechanism of infection. Once those are better understood, Various novel vaccine candidates are designed and tested for safety, dosage, and efficacy in a process known as clinical trials. Clinical trials run in two to four phases and may take as much as 10 years to complete, involving thousands of human subjects in the process. The candidate or candidates that provide better results are prepared for mass production, which includes development of a specific production process and scale up to the volume necessary according to dosage and population coverage. As you may imagine, given the wide variety of potential vaccine types and considering that each production process is unique to each vaccine, the steps necessary to complete the commercialization of a novel vaccine take a considerable amount of time. That is the conundrum in which we find ourselves today as we do our best to deal with the coronavirus emergency.